You know, sometimes I think we forget how great God is, what he has done for us, what he does for us. And in that vein, I wanted to look at something this, this, this week, this morning, that if you were watching my five-minute message last week, you saw a little Reader's Digest version of. And that's, why as Christians do we love Jesus Christ? Why is that important? We should never forget why we love Christ. Because if we forget, then it becomes ritual. If it becomes ritual, it becomes empty. And we never want our worship to become empty. And for those, if you're here and you're not a Christian, you may be wondering, why do these people come to church all the time? Why are these people so dedicated to Jesus Christ? Why do they love him so much? Well, to fully answer that, it would take me about a day and a half, and I don't think any of you want to stay here that long. But I picked out a few things that, at least to me, are some of the reasons that I love Jesus Christ and some of the reasons why we as Christians love our Lord and Savior. The first thing is, we love Jesus because he's our creator. You realize that? Jesus Christ made us and made us who we are today. He has been here from the very beginning. If you look at John chapter 1, we're going to look at verses 1 through 3 and then verse 14. It says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. And if you're wondering, well, how do you know the Word is Jesus Christ? Verse 14 says that the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's who our Lord Savior is. He is God. He is the one who created us. In fact, he made man and woman in the very beginning. If you look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, we'll look at 7, and then we're going to look at verses 21 and 22 for the woman. So for the man, we only get one verse. The woman gets two verses. How is that? Verse 7 says, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became as a living creature. And verse 21 and 22 say, So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Now here's an interesting fact. Anytime you see that word Lord like that, where it's all capital letters, that word in Hebrew is Yehovah, what we Anglically call Jehovah. Jehovah turns out is Jesus Christ. Let me point that out to you. First we go back to when he was with uh, Moses. He was with us through all, all of our journeys and he was with Moses at the burning bush. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 13 and 14 or 13 through 15 it says that Moses said to God if I come to the people of Israel and say to them the God of your fathers has sent me to you and they ask me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel, I am has sent me, sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel, the Lord, the God of our fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, he sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Interestingly enough, that name I am does not talk about a beginning or an end, but it always been. So how do I know this is Jesus Christ? A very interesting little thing happened when Jesus was in 
Jerusalem. And he was being questioned by the Pharisees and Sadducees. And the Pharisees and Sadducees were so full of themselves, saying, but we are of Abraham. And Jesus, in John chapter 8, verses 58 and 59, said, You say to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. And the Jews knew exactly what he was saying. Verse 59, so they picked up stones to throw at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple. They knew what he was saying. And that name Jesus, literally translated, Jehovah of salvation. Why do we love Jesus Christ? He made me. And some of you said he may have messed up on that, and that's okay. I think he did this for a reason. I think he has a sense of humor, and he needs a little laugh from time to time. Because when I make mistakes, I make them big. I don't make little ones. I have given my wife and friends hours of entertainment with some of the mistakes I've made. (laughs) But that's the way he made me. So I would look at things differently. I wouldn't accept the status quo as the status quo. And it served me to this point. But that's because that's what he wanted for me. He made me perfect according to his will. And when I strayed, he brought me back. And every time I stray again, he brings me back again. Sometimes gently, sometimes by the earlobe. Because he loves me. And he does the same for you. He loves each and every one of you. You were made exactly the way God wanted you to be made. You were created perfect. It's just once we got off on our own, we messed it up ourselves. So we love Jesus Christ because he made us perfect. We also love Jesus Christ because he taught, teaches us the right way to live. You realize that? Jesus said that he gives us life abundantly. What a great blessing that is. Do you understand that? In John chapter 10, verse 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That word abundantly means above what's required. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying that because we're Christians, we're going to be rich and drive fancy cars and have big fancy houses. That's not what he's talking about. We have life abundantly because we have a joy that the world does not share. We have a peace beyond all understanding that the world does not share. And we have this not just here and now, but for all eternity. We have life abundantly. See, Jesus teaches us the proper way, or the proper priorities to have in our life. In the book of Matthew, chapter, 20, or verse, chapter 12, verses 28 through 31, it says, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. What he is saying is it's God first All of my neighbors second, me third. It's not what we hear today, is it? 
Get all the gusto of life that you can. It's all about you. You're number one. That's not true. We're number three. You see, he's taught us it's not all about me. My life is not measured on how successful I am financially, how many friends I have, how many trips I've been on, how rich I can grow. No, my life is measured on something much deeper and ultimately much more satisfying than that. It is measured on a spiritual level of how I can grow and how well I can be a servant. He taught me that in this life, it's not about me. We care about others. God first, everybody else second. In Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 through 40, he said, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and gave you drink? And when did we see you, a stranger, and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them. Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. That's what our life is about. It's not about what can I get, it's what can I help others get. Zig Ziglar once said, and he's a motivational speaker if you don't know Zig Ziglar, he said, you'll get, everything out of, you'll get everything out of life that you've wanted once you've helped everybody else get what they needed out of life first. Jesus said, our life is not about gimme, gimme, gimme. It's about give, give, give. Help. 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 Comfort. To truly be happy, we need to look around and see how we can help others, not see how we can gain more. Jesus teaches us to love. He taught me how to love. When I, before I became a Christian, love was just one of those words I thought, oh, it must be a feeling that just kind of sweeps over you. Not even close. The first thing he taught, he said, first, you have to understand, I love you. That Jesus loves every one of us, individually. We're told that he knows the number of hairs on your head. Yep, Marvin and I are the same way. It's a short count. <laughs> but he knows who we are intimately. In the book of 1 John chapter 4, verse 16, it says, So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love. Whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. In John chapter 13, verse 34. A new commandment I give you that you love one another. How? Just as I have loved you. You are also, you also are to love one another. He demonstrates his love for us. How did he do that? Think back at his ministry. He was teaching on a hillside. There were some 5,000 that were there, and they were hungry, and they weren't going anywhere. He could have went, well, it's their choice. Guess I'll just have to be hungry until they go home. No, he loved them. And he took a boy with three loaves of bread and a fish, 
and he fed 5,000 people with it. There was enough left over to gather up the crumbs. Think back in your life. How many times did things look so bad for you and then all of a sudden something happened and it turned around? Jesus says he'll never tempt us beyond what we can't handle and he'll provide us a way of escape. That's someone who loves us and cares for us. So by his example, he taught us how to love. But you know, he didn't just leave it at that and say, follow my example. He went on and through his apostles continued to teach us. In the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and actually most of the Bible, it teaches us how to love each other. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 4 through 7. Look how much is packed into this, these four verses. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast or is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things endures all things. That last sentence is a description of my wife. Because she has bared all things with me. And even when there was a harebrained scheme, she believed in me. And she had hope for me. And she has endured a lot. That's love. That's what love does. That's the way Jesus is with us. He bears all of our, our, our sorrows and sins. He believes in us. He hopes that we will come through for him and be with him in heaven. And he endures it all. Because it doesn't matter what we do, we can always come back to him. He never shuts the door on us until the day we die. But beyond that, he taught us how to love God. Such a short verse and there's so much in it. John chapter 14, verse 15. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That's it. You want to love God? Do what he says. Learn from his word. Follow the directions. That's how we love God. And finally, this morning, Jesus teaches us how to sacrifice. In the book of John, chapter 15, verse 13, it says, Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. Every war, there are war heroes who will throw themselves on a grenade or run through open fire to try to save their brothers in, uh, in battle and who die. These people are called war heroes. We remember them tomorrow. They are given medals of honor so that their families will never forget why they died, that they did not die in vain, they died for their brother and sister. But see, it didn't just stop there. Jesus demonstrated that same thing for us when he was willing to die for us on the cross. In John chapter 10, verse 16 through 18, I have other sheep that are not of the fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock 
and one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. This charge I have received from my Father. He willingly died for us. Knowing that we are sinners. That we have given ourselves over to sin. And Jesus said, I'm not giving up on you. There's only one way to bring you back. It's going to take a perfect sacrifice. And I will be that perfect sacrifice. And so he came and he took on flesh. And he grew up the same way we grow up. He was tempted in the same way that we are tempted. And when the time came, he freely gave himself to be crucified. When the guards showed up at the Garden of Eden to take him, he didn't run. He didn't try to hide. He says, who do you look for? They said, Jesus of Nazareth. He said, that's me. And they took him away. And they beat him. And they humiliated him. And he still went through it. You see, today... Or not today, but back then, many would resist crucifixion. They didn't want to get their hands pierced. So what the Roman soldiers would do is they would tie the ropes around their wrists. Oops, sorry. And then two soldiers, one on each side, would take and stretch him out. And then they would drive the nails in with him, screaming in pain and trying to fight it every step of the way. The Bible never says, but in my mind, I imagine Jesus saying, excuse me, and laying down on the cross and putting his feet where they needed to be and then putting his hands out for the soldiers. No man takes my life. I give it willingly. And he did that for me. Because he loved me that much. But he didn't just do it for me. He did it for you because he loves you that much he died so we could have the hope of eternal salvation Romans chapter 5 verses 7 through 9 says for one will scarcely die for a righteous person though perhaps a good person one would even dare to die but God shows his love for us while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. While we were still rejecting him, he was dying for us. Since therefore we have been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him. From the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. We love Jesus Christ because he was willing to die for me so that I could be reconciled, so that my sins, which are unforgivable, could be forgiven. It was the only way. And he was willing to do it. <coughs> Excuse me. So we need to ask ourselves, if Jesus was willing to do that, what are we willing to give Christ? <coughs> Why is this important? It's so we, we don't become ritualistic. We don't become complacent. 
It doesn't become a routine for us. We remember who he was and why he died and what he taught us. And he taught us how to be happy in this life and how to have peace beyond all understanding and to have joy. Why do we love Jesus? He is our creator. He is our teacher in life. He is our teacher in love. And he is our teacher in how to be sacrificial and lead, and lead a sacrificial life. Simply put, 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. We love because he first loved us.